Hello to everyone, wherever you are, whenever you are. Um, thank you for tuning in to uh, Talks at Google. And we're going to hear from uh, Adam Kay, who's a fantastic former doctor. But before we do that, I thought it'd be really nice to hear from our very own Vicky Woodall, who has a very personal uh, connection to Adam and to some of the topics we're going to talk about. So hello, Vicky. Morning, Matt. How are you doing? All right. How are you? Yeah, really good. And re do you know what? I'm really excited to have Adam here today because actually I haven't met him in person, albeit we are we are in one of his books. So as you say, like to have a have a personal connection to have Adam coming in today, we're we're very, very excited because um I think we've all got so much to be thankful for the NHS for, right? Um and I, I think you've had a read of the book. I certainly have. Um and you know, for us personally, our reason to say thank you, and and some Googlers may already know this, but actually it's not only for COVID at this very moment in time, but actually um, our son sadly was diagnosed with a very rare cancer, a very, very aggressive and rare cancer um, back in 2017. Um, and actually the NHS, we, we couldn't have depended on, any, on them anymore. Um, and they helped save him essentially. Um, so they saw him through 14 rounds of chemo, 30 rounds of proton therapy. He had part of his spine removed. You know, it, was, it was a harrowing year. And yet all the individuals we saw and here reading some of these, these stories in here really, really bring it home to me. And actually, you might think, well, what does that mean you get in the book for, Vicky? Because that's, that's yes, that's not a great story. But actually, like, um, it was Jack Whitehall that made the connection. So Jack came around visiting the ward at Christmas 2017. We, we, he came and joined us playing corridor football, as you do. Um, and it was when um, Adam reached out to various number of celebrities to be in the book. Jack chose to write about us. Um, so if you've not bought it already, I would thoroughly recommend because actually this book is full of loads of fantastic stories um, and, and not only so how we can be grateful for the NHS. And also on top of that today, we, we're, we're mega fans of Adam's. Um, so we've also got his latest book. I feel like, I, I feel like I'm advertising for him already. But um, joking aside, um, through George's experience of cancer and everything we've done with the Giant Pledge um, and trying to help the NHS ourselves in raising money for the NHS, this book actually helps explain to our children what it was that George went through with his cancer experience. So do you know what? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we couldn't be more excited to have him today. And as I say, it's a very, very personal reason. So yeah, that's why I'm very excited. And Vicky, I'm gonna ask you to come back and, and uh, field some questions from our audience. But before we do that, um, you also are surrounded by uh, George and Giants Pledge merchandise. Um, and I, I, I'd love it if you could give uh, friends and colleagues a bit of an update on your fundraising activities because you raised an unbelievable amount in the last uh, in the last months yeah Do you know, yeah so actually when when George was first diagnosed um we saw things that no children should ever experience um it's such a harrowing place to be but at the Royal Mars it was also the most heartwarming place to be so just three days before he was actually diagnosed we set up what was then called George and the Giant Pledge. Um, we've now raised over writing a daily blog. Um, you can find it, if you look at giantpledge.com, people can find the longer version of the story. If you look up um, at Giant Pledge on Instagram or Twitter, you can follow our story because we still to this day write a daily blog. But yeah, we've now raised with the help of Googlers, with the help of Jack Whitehall, with the help of hundreds of thousands of people, I kid you not, 1.8 million pounds for the NHS, for the Royal Marsden Cancer Charity to help each child with cancer. So it's been, been one hell of a roller coaster, and as I say, even though he's got a 50 50 chance of survival, none of the money's ever been for us, it's all been to fund and support children with cancer and the brilliant NHS staff and all that they do. So, yeah, like I, we, we also love Adam because the money from this book and um, profits from this book also go towards NHS charities together. So, all in all, it's a, it's a brilliant fundraising feat across the board. Well, congratulations for what you've done, and our huge respect and support continues to be with you and your family. So, Vicky, we'll be seeing you a bit later to take uh, questions from the audience, but for now, thank you. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, then to introduce you to Adam Kay. As Vicky said, a junior doctor, but also one of the country's best selling authors. This is going to hurt his 2017, uh, literally, his diaries of being a junior doctor. It's a harrowing, heartwarming, and also incredibly funny read. Uh, it's a multi million bestseller. Um, and uh, 37 different languages I think it's been translated into. It's touched people around the world. He also has a live show uh, of the same name. Um, it's sold over 100,000 tickets, and it's just come back. It's on at the Apollo Theatre in London until mid-November. He has another book towards the night shift before Christmas, which is also going to be on at the Palace Theatre uh, between Christmas and the New Year, both of those in London, if you can, if you can get to them. So uh, that's where it started. And then, as Vicky said, uh, published this year, this amazing organ by organ 
uh, tour of the human body. It says it's complete and completely disgusting. Uh, I learned some stuff from it as well. It's not just woo and, uh, we and poo. Uh, mental health is in there and all kinds of uh, things which children should know about. And then uh, this remarkable volume, it's actually 109 stories um, from celebrities across the spectrum in the UK, all profits to NHS charities together and to the Lullaby Trust of which Adam is a patron. It celebrates personal stories of the NHS and the 1.5 million people who work within it. It's already raised over a quarter of a million for those, uh, those charities. I kind of picked it up thinking, well, it's going to be a bit of a coffee table book. It's incredibly moving actually uh, to read this. So uh, let's say a warm welcome to Adam Kay. Are you there? I'm here. Thanks for having me. Adam, so a bit of a build up for you. W welcome, actually, say welcome back to Google. So you've done one of these before when we were talking about a previous book, but 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 this is quite a remarkable, this is quite a remarkable um, volume, actually. Could, could you tell us a bit about um, where it came from and how you put it together? So um, the idea for Dear NHS sort of came out of a feeling of helplessness. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in through the pandemic wondering what I could do. And that's amplified by loads of my mates still working in the health service and even family members. You know, I'm seeing them, you know, going onto the front line, literally putting their lives on the line, you know, working so far beyond the call of duty. And um, I put my hat in the ring when there was a shout out for former doctors, but it turns out they didn't want a, um, a gynecologist who's not worked for a decade. And so um, I tried to think of something practical that I could that I could do and came up with this idea of a sort of love letter to the NHS, a really big thank you note so that the people on the front line will know how important the work they're doing is and also with the idea of raising money for charity so it can say you know thank you in a more practical way and so i um fired off a bunch of emails to everyone i knew who was famous and any friends of friends of friends who were famous and, and basically just to see if there was any appetite for it and uh, the reason there are 109 uh, uh entries rather than 100 uh, is everyone said yes and uh, I assumed it would be like like when you're inviting people to a wedding and you sort of do it in stages when people sort of regretfully can't attend. But, um, but everyone was a, was a yes. And I mean, the, the list of names is just it's off the chart from like Paul McCartney and Amelia Clark, Peter Kay, Stephen Fry, Dawn French. Um, I'm so thoroughly proud of, um, of of what we managed to achieve and so grateful to all those people who um, who made the book what it is. And actually, there's quite a variety of different formats, quite a lot of personal stories in there, but some people have written poems and, and, and so on. Did you give them any guidance as to what you were looking for? Or is it really just what inspired them about the NHS? It's an absolute blank check. And, uh, and I just said, all I want, please, is a story about you or your family that sort of says what the NHS means to you. And I didn't say whether it should be a sentence or a, or a you know a, a ten thousand word essay. And people interpreted it in all sorts of ways. But like brilliantly, Jamie Oliver, his contribution, uh, his best way of saying thank you was a couple of great recipes that people can yeah. can batch cook and give to the the NHS people in their lives. Um, and I was. I was very surprised actually by a lot of the stuff that uh, that came that came back. So, like for example, um, Jimmy Carr, um, who's obviously a fantastically funny comedian. I assumed he was going to write, you know, something hilarious. That's what he does. And instead, what, what Jimmy sent was this utterly moving, rather wonderful. Um, piece about the death of his mother and talking openly about death and the importance of that and it's a, it's a it's a heartbreaking and quite important read and um to be honest it all just showed me how important the health service is mm. and how there there isn't anyone who it hasn't touched i mean as i said i i found it really surprising how much richness there was there and, and also how moving it was a few things that jumped out for me that, you know, it ranges from Louis Theroux talking about his testicle, Lee Mack and his prostate, saving Malala's life, Michael Palin being um, surrounded by doctor fans who got in the way of his treatment, David Tennant's seven-week-old baby, 
Um, David Skinner, and, um, uh, sorry, uh, Frank Skinner and David Baddiel, both of them had partners who had a broken toe or a finger cut off, which is interesting. Um, Alex Brooker, really moving story of how he was looked after by Great Ormond Street over so many years. And it goes on and on. Sue Perkins, not surprisingly, with a vacuum cleaner and Jack Whitehall, his story of meeting George and playing football with him. But there's a, so there's a huge variety in there, really entertaining stuff. And but are there any that particularly uh, moved you, given the background that you had in, in the health service? Um, Dawn French, I found particularly moving, again, talking about uh, her mother's final illness. And she paints a very truthful warts and all depiction of the NHS and doesn't pretend that it's anything it isn't and um, she's one of the people who lots of the people in the book there was a bit of a thread of people remembering you know the names of the staff and yeah. you know it's you know if I was on a labour ward delivering you know maybe 12 babies on a busy day I don't realistically remember that you know the names of all these people it's it's a blur of, of patients but um it reminds you of the the huge impact these individuals um in the healthcare service have on the you know have on the on the patients and you know, dawn's i was so well she's a, she's a phenomenal writer and she writes so powerfully um another one that really sticks out is graham norton um, he was right at the start of the book, and um, I guess this is surprising because Graham's been a sort of fixture of our lives. If you you know switch on telly any time in the last you know couple of decades, Graham, Graham's there, and and he he told something so you know personal and I, sort of was a surprise somehow, even though he's someone I don't I don't know you know at all, but you feel you you do. Um, he wrote about moving to London from Ireland as a young drama student. And, um, you know, the sort of nervousness he has about him moving to a new country away from his family. And he's coming back home after a night out and he gets stabbed. And he talks about sort of going door to door, trying to find someone who can call him an ambulance. And he writes, um, talking to the, the nurse and saying, I am gonna be all right, yeah? and said so the nurse paused before answering and in that moment his sort of skin hugged his bones but he talks about the health service as being this sort of safety net that scooped him up that was there for him you know in place of his his family who who, who were no longer there and uh, yeah it's um I'm, I'm really, as I say, I'm just very proud of um, of all these contributors. I mean, I basically did nothing. I just sent a bunch of emails. Um, but the, for the book, thanks to the generosity of all the people. Well, I mean, you obviously are pretty well connected to be able to get this, like you say, amazing array of uh, of people. Is there anybody that you, you tried to get that declined you that we should know about? <laughs> I mean, there, there are two, uh, but I'm probably not going to broadcast it to your audience. We'll do that one over a pint. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. It's a tough, it's an unfair question, but you know, you did mention how often the names of the staff stuck in the minds of people. And I guess that's maybe a key to you know reading your works. Uh, something that is magical about the NHS is obviously the people. It's not the buildings and the clinics and the processes and the technology. It's the it, it's the people. And I wanted to ask you, like in this moment uh, that we're in now, you know, and and actually just overnight the news stories across. Europe of, of rising case counts and further dramatic measures in many countries. In this moment we're in now, what's wonderful about the NHS and what do you worry about being sort of broken about the NHS? Let's just take take stock from your perspective of having been in it, but now having been sort of removed from it for a while. So, I mean, what's wonderful about the NHS are two things. First of all, are the million and a half people who make it up, um, who pull together who've always gone so far beyond the call of duty and never more so than this year to keep the rest of us on the roads. The second thing that's wonderful about the NHS is what it stands for, that it's free at the point of service based on clinical needs and not based on your bank balance. And you don't quite realise what an amazing thing it is until you experience other healthcare systems 
that you know that operate in a in a rather different way. And I think the um, the diametric opposite is is in the states. I've been unfortunate enough to be um, ill in the states and need medical assistance a couple of times, and it is a two-tier system and in any two-tier system the people who have least the people who need it the most often are the people who suffer the most as a result and you know i, I was exsanguinating bleeding out in, in you know not in a not in a life-threatening way but in a sort of slightly alarming way and i would i couldn't get any help until they'd made sure that my insurance was valid until they'd made sure that they had a backup credit card just in case anything went wrong. And that is not how I think healthcare should should be. Hmm. I think I may be misremembering it, but I think Chris O'Dowd tells a story of, you know, NHS treatment and then uh, going into a labor ward in the US with his wife and having to get the paperwork signed while she's having you know, the contractions. There's just a very different uh, experience of delivery in almost every other Kind of country. Stanley Tucci uh, also talks about, you know, as, as someone who's uh, who's lived in the States and then uh, moved to the, uh, the UK where he where he now lives, um, his disbelief that it was free, you know, couldn't work it out because it's so madly different yeah. to um, to the other version of doing it. So, I mean, but I think you know what it was founded to do seventy two years ago um, is it does us does us proud. As a, as a country. What's wrong with it? The, it's, the system is totally fit for purpose. The system works. The system just needs a bit more money than it has at the moment. And um, there's a, if I can be boring, there's a, there's a concept called health inflation, which is basically the amount of money you need to pump into a healthcare system to provide the same service you did the year before. You know, everything Everything gets more expensive, obviously, and in healthcare, you know, your population's getting older, there's new drugs, there's new technologies, and so 3% sort of covers it. And the NHS increased by at least 3% in real terms every year for decades and decades and decades. And then over the last decade, that dropped to 1%. And so there wasn't even enough money going in to provide the service they did the year before. And the people who didn't suffer were the patients. The people who suffered were the staff who ended up working double shift. And then it would get, you know, if you're covering two people's jobs, that's sustainable for, you know, a week, a month, maybe a length of maternity leave. But if that's permanent, you know, eventually people will leave. And then it becomes a vicious cycle and the system gets more and more and more stretched. And um now more money is being being put into the NHS, which is which is great, and it's now at or above the three percent mark. But it doesn't make up for a decade where it, it didn't have that. And so, what I'm saying is, when this pandemic hit, it hit an NHS that didn't really have any fat on its bones. It didn't have the slack in the system that it needed to, to be able to, to um, you know, provide the service it wanted it to do. And but the NHS didn't collapse. And the reason it didn't collapse is these people who were already giving everything gave somehow even more and, and kept it all together. And I would say that was to a large extent, um, despite the decisions that were being made rather than, you know, because of the decisions that were being made that the NHS survived. And, um, and in this book, and I'm just looking at the dates, you know, you it's almost 10 years exactly that you you left the nhs or you you, you sort of stopped uh, being um a, a doctor but even in this it's very apparent how long the hours that you're working how much you're covering shifts how impossible it is a constant repeating story of missed uh, weddings and births and friends and all kinds of social engagements because of that cover and that was before the 10 years of those are the good old yeah um yeah. And one of the things I've heard you talk about before and be interested because in the context of your anatomy book, which is obviously going to inspire and uh, energize, hopefully, lots of young people about health and potentially um, the medical profession, you're quite critical of the way in which we make choices about careers and how you became a doctor and how difficult it is to sort of um, identify who might be suitable for these kind of careers. Can maybe tell us a bit about, about your views on, on that? Yes. Um, having just slagged off America, I'm now going to point out one thing America does really well, I think. And that is 
um, you decide to be a doctor, generally as a postgraduate degree. So you're in, probably in your early 20s, you've got a bit of life experience under your belt. You've probably left home, you've probably had to earn some money, you've maybe had a relationship. But, you know, your sort of, you know, your worldview has, has got a wider angle than what happens in the UK, which is, it's a decision you make when you're 16, basically, when you choose the A-level or hires that the, um, the medical schools want you to have. And 16 is obviously a terrible age to, to make any decisions, but to, to make the decision of what you want to do for the rest of your life, I'm not sure you have your eyes wide open. And then the medical schools, they recruit on the basis of having loads of, you know, A's at A-level and loads of extracurricular activities. And if you've done your work experience with a surgeon or whatever, none of this stuff actually sort of digs into the fact that it's a job about communication that it's a job that is stressful that has a psychological toll to it and and i, I think i think that's something that we, that we do need to improve because certainly i didn't have any idea what the job was really about until i actually started doing it and i went into working on labeling which was um, you know, one of the most high octane, you know, cutting edge frontline bits of medicine. And uh, it was only when bad things started to happen, I realized that I'd never been taught how to cope with the bad stuff. And in fact, these diaries were basically my way of looking for mm. the light of the dark. It was my coping mechanism in the absence of anyone having taught me a proper coping mechanism. Mm. And I mean, I, I know this through friends who, who've been in a similar position, but the lack of sort of mental health support and counselling uh, for the kinds of things that, that you were dealing with. Uh, and and you, I think you said you chose uh, Obs and Gynae because of the sort of tremendous highs and the ability to actually help people in, in, in need. But that also comes with tremendous lows and there is nowhere to turn for any support on anything like that. No, there, there just wasn't. And it's getting a bit better now. Lots of people are banging the, the drum for, you know, looking after the, um, you know, the people who look after, look after us. And, you know, I eventually left the profession when I had a really bad day at work. And I won't go into exactly what, what happened, but all you ever want is a healthy mum and a healthy baby from every case. And this was one of the awful situations where we ended up with neither of those two things. And I, I realized that I just didn't have the, didn't have thick enough armor or I made of the wrong stuff or whatever it was and ended up leaving. And at the time it happened, it was like I said, I'd sprained my ankle or something. Oh no, that's awful, you're all right. But obviously you can do clinic in the morning, right? Mm. Um, and you know, you work in a, in a big organization. Um, if you worked in an, in an organization where one member of staff took their life every single week, which is what happens to doctors in the NHS, I think that would be considered a, a crisis and there would be huge efforts made to, you know, to, to address this. Um, the NHS does need to get better at looking after, looking after its own staff. I and mean, that, that's a terrible statistic and that's, that's current. Yes. That was, a, that was a, an article published in the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, by Claire Gerarda uh, last year. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a crisis. And do you think that the, you know, some good can come of the current pandemic in terms of, you mentioned kind of an increase finally in, in funding for the NHS. I guess there's been changes as well with, with technology in, you know, um, remote diagnoses and remote consultations happening. Are there, are there some things that you think will, will shift for the better as a result of this period that we're in? I think we have to look for the positives when we're, you know, when we're in such a, a difficult place. And I think there will doubtless be be positives from things, like, from basic things like community cohesion, the fact that people are pulling together and, you know, making sure that the elderly people down there, you know, down the end of their road are getting their, you know, the, the, the food and the, you know, and the gross, groceries that they need when they can't um, leave the house. Um, I think, um, support and love for the nhs has never been 
has never been higher. And I think that if there's ever an existential threat to its existence, then people will fight extremely hard for it, harder than ever before. I think that there has actually been more of an emphasis on the well-being of staff. And um, there have been initiatives like... Um, uh, like airlines rather wonderfully have provided their staff to man um, rooms for, for doctors and nurses and midwives and everyone to, to hang out in where they can get a, you know, a cup of coffee and, and, re and read a, a newspaper and just, you know, sit down for 10 minutes. Little things like that, they might sound small, but they are actually very important for the, for the well-being of, of, of staff. Um, and you know it's uh technology is a it's a complicated is a complicated one um there are lots of examples where uh where not being able to see someone in person makes things worse but there are also examples where it makes things much better a friend of mine uh works um uh in a very remote area and his um his patients travel often um hundreds of miles because it's a sort of specialist um it's an area of medicine he works in, and he's been saying for years, can we not do some sort of remote thing? So for like follow-up consultations, I'm sure we could do this over um, yeah. over the phone or over the internet. And he got the answer again and again for years that, you know, for, for reasons of confidentiality and this and that, and we don't have the technology. All of a sudden, um, when, uh, when the virus hit, um, this service was up and running um, within something like a fortnight, yeah. and um, and I, you know, he he hopes will continue for appropriate patients. You know, you know when um, you know when we're when we're when we're on the other side of this, which will hopefully be um, it be soon, obviously. Um, and you know, it's just I think medicine, as with every industry, has 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 we've learned that a lot of things that we assumed we had to go in to do you don't necessarily need to go go in to do as we're on the topic of technology and medicine um I, I, and this is talks at google i should probably ask you about your views on the merits or otherwise of googling health information uh, <laughs> in your experience uh so t tell us how you think that has changed things and, and what the issues are and maybe the benefits are as well of that Oh yeah, I mean, it's hugely important for patients to be informed. That's vital. And I think the days are now gladly long gone, whereby this the doctor would be this patrician figure saying, this is what you must do. If a doctor tells you that, the, actually the chances are very low that you'll you'll do what you're you're told. It's all a discussion between the doctor and the patient and their family about you know which option to, to best go down. And this works best when the patient knows the most about um, about their condition. And the internet has been the most enormous benefit. Um, the flip side of it is. Um, you can create something that uh, we know as a cyberchondriac, which is basically if you Google any one symptom or two symptoms, you will find a website telling you you are definitely going to die. And so it isn't necessarily always good for uh, for the patient's mental well-being. You know, you know, you've, you've got your appointment with your GP in a week. You've you've pretty much decided you're going to die that's an un, that's an unpleasant week until the doctor can say i think it probably is just a bit of a headache you know it's um but um i mean the truth of it is um when <laughs> when the doctor um gives you a you know a specimen pot and sends you off to the the toilet to, for a urine sample and do you um and you you're not quite sure why you're giving it but i mean they're the doctor they probably know best uh, chances are that they're using uh, those two minutes to to quickly google um <laughs> your symptoms are. so i mean do as doctors I, I i was certainly very grateful for the uh, for having unlimited uh, resources at my fingertips I'll, I'll watch out for that next time in, i'm in that situation uh, also, thank you for say, i'm just going to look up your results and they twist the screen they're probably also googling at that point trying to describe <laughs> <Yeah. a laughs> <rationally>. <laughs> So it's a mixed blessing, but a more informed patient and doctor is probably a better thing in your in your view over over time is what I'm hearing. Ab absolutely. I okay. mean, um, technology has immeasurably changed what medicine looks like. Um, you know, when I was in my first year working as a doctor, if someone had an X-ray, you know, you needed to find the physical X-ray and yeah. hold it up to a light box. And chances are a quarter of the time you couldn't find it and been filed in the wrong place. You know, that's 
a relatively short time ago, but it, it's, yeah. it feels absolutely bananas that that was the case. Now, you know, you just sort of, you tap it onto your, your computer and, and, it, and it appears right there in front of you. So, yeah, you can't be, you can't be a Luddite um, and, work in, uh, and work in medicine. There are huge numbers of technological jumps in every generation of doctors. Now, through, throughout your medical career, you were, you were noting down, you know, diaries of what had been happening. You've obviously got a tremendous uh, sense of what's funny and humorous. There's an awful lot of, you know, literally laugh out loud moments in, in your story. But how did you make the transition from a doctor keeping a diary to leaving the health service and starting to get into comedy? How, how did that happen? Yeah, it basically happened because I didn't have a plan B at all. Um, I, because I'd gone straight from school to medical school and then straight into working as a doctor, I'd never been, even had like three months where I worked as a, you know, as a, you know, helping out a gardener where I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any other idea. All I knew is something I'd done in the bit was try to write like funny sketches and songs and things. And I thought, to be honest, I thought I would be back in medicine in six to 12 months, retraining right at the bottom in a different specialty, maybe general practice or something that I felt like I might be better suited to. And um, and it was it was sheer luck that um, trying something that I had an interest in ended up um, taking off. I was given um, breaks by some by some very kind people um, at the BBC and I ended up writing um, writing on various um, TV shows, um, did a bit of performing and um, it was yeah it was it was it was sheer luck that that um, that I landed on my feet with with this that I didn't end up going you know going back when you know as soon as uh, as my as I hit the, my maximum overdraft um, and um, but yeah it's certainly an unusual career and I I didn't to be honest ever think that I would end up being a writer these diaries I'd written were private and personal yeah. and they just you know sat in a shoebox at the bottom of a filing cabinet. Um, um, and you might remember about four or five years ago, the junior doctors ended up going on strike. Um, there was um, there was a there was a disagreement about a, a contract, and I felt that the doctors weren't getting their side of the story across. And it was sort of heartbreaking mm. hearing sort of misinformation that you know because the government has got an extremely loud voice, doctors have got a very quiet voice because they're at work a hundred hours a week being doctors. So that sort of that fired me up to um, to get these these diaries published thinking that you know if a thousand people maybe even read um what it was like on the front line then next time round that would be another thousand people who would you know be you know be on the doctor's side um as it happens it you know really took off uh, a, a bit better than that and uh, and i'm and i'm extremely grateful to, to all those people who've who've, who've read it because yeah, you actually uh, you end your book with uh, an open letter to the Secretary of State, which is very heartfelt, in which you sort of advise that perhaps they should spend some time working with doctors to understand the frontline reality of the health service. And obviously, there's a, it's an enormous bureaucracy to run that kind of organisation with one and a half million staff and so on. But it is a challenge, isn't it, for for one politician to be at the helm of something so enormous and so complicated. It, it is, I, and I absolutely stand by that. And it's a very strange system that one day you can be in charge of culture, and then the next day you're in charge of health, and then the day after that you're in charge of the military, and then, you know, and then, the, and then you're in charge of the treasury. It, I don't understand it, but I think the very least these people can do is understand exactly what it's like on the front line. Um, there's been a bit of a recurring theme over the last year of doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals not being listened to. And like, you know, there was obviously a bit of a debacle with the protective equipment and um, doctors and nurses were saying, we don't have enough protective equipment. And for whatever reason, the government was saying, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. They do know what they're talking about. Mm. They've got no skin in the game. They've got no ulterior motive whatsoever. It's all about the health and well-being of the people they're trying to look after. And I and I beg politicians to, 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 to realise that. And I think that actually seeing them in action 
you know at work is is the best way to under understand it and i'm sure the same the same is true for any business if you don't know what the people who are doing the jobs you know on the front line are up to then i'm not sure that you're you know that you, that you can adequately do your job at the top absolutely i'm just writing that down um, <laughs> That sounds like good advice. Can I ask you a bit? We touched on like, you know, the reasons for becoming a doctor and going into health. What were the reasons be behind uh, publishing a, a book that was very squarely targeted uh, at children? What What are you aiming to do to do there? So, I mean, first of all, we're clearly going to need lots and lots of doctors. So we might as yeah, well recruit right. them now. Um, I think ultimately I was always fascinated by the body and the way it works and the ways it sometimes doesn't work from a young age. And I guess I've always had this slight confusion that um, it's never had particularly high billing as a cool thing for kids, certainly compared to space and dinosaurs, which are obviously brilliant. But I think I think medicine is 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 right up there. And I think maybe it's because kids are forced to learn about um, mm. about medicine, uh, you know, and science and biology lessons. Anytime you're sat on an uncomfortable chair and it's up on a you know up on the whiteboard in front of you. you you know, that probably decreases your enjoyment a little. I just wanted to share my enthusiasm um, for uh, for the human body, which is, you know, um, which is the most incredible piece of equipment. It's certainly the most complicated bit, uh, bit of equipment. Um, uh, like the brain has a hundred trillion different connections a hundred trillion is is a lot that's the number of stars in a thousand galaxies um if you had a hundred trillion pounds you could buy every house on the planet it's an it's an enormous almost inconceivable number and everyone's brains have got that has got that that many connections in it i just wanted to uh, share that and also the disgusting stuff that i'm pretty sure that kids like and also to touch on the stuff that um is sort of slightly more difficult and sometimes slightly harder for for adults to know how to address, like when things don't go, you know, exactly to plan, like asthma and diabetes and epilepsy that kids and their mates might know about. Also things like um, you know, mental health and talking about anxiety and depression and talking about body image and smoking and, and alcohol and all these stuff that's, that's, that's really important. And it's very easy for me to write about because you know i can i can go away i can look up the very best way to talk about difficult things but often i suspect parents feel a bit ambushed like they don't have the they don't have the, the right answer to give mm. thank you um if you're watching live then do please submit your questions we'll come to some audience questions via vicky uh, vicky woodle in a moment um before we do that uh, adam um you're, you're currently doing live stand-up i think your shows shows have had over a hundred thousand people in them in the past What's it like to be in theatres in a uh, controlled experience with reduced capacity and, and people in masks? What's that experience like? It's different, um, but uh, I'm so glad that it's happening um, because the option, there are two options. One is there is no live theatre, there are no live events. And the other one is we adapt and change. And in terms of the theatre, that means an audience who wears masks. It means um, social distancing. So uh, the theatre I'm in normally holds uh, the best part of a thousand people. It's now 300 people. So mm. space and you're ordering drinks using your you're using your your phone rather than queuing at bars. One way system, hand gels, um, temperature checks. It's a very different experience. But the audience reaction I've had has been, I'm going to say, better than before the pandemic, because this is a group of people who I think have been desperate to have some semblance of normality, to get back to the theatre, to, you know, enjoy um, art, not through their their screens. And it's obviously great that, that, you know, we have been able to access art in various forms, you know, online, but nothing beats, you know, being yeah. being in a being in a comfy um, velvet chair and, uh, and looking up at a stage. So I'm so so glad that I've been able to be a part of getting the West End back on its feet. Yeah, I mean, such an important part of our cultural life and so hard to access at the moment. So it's great to see theatres open. We'll see We'll see how it lasts, right? So you, you've got another show due over Christmas and uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue to enjoy that kind of uh, that kind of facility despite the despite the yeah, government. I mean, as long as it's as long as it's safe, um, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to support the, uh, the, the arts. And it's 
I think people sometimes don't realise that uh, the people you see on the stage are the tiniest fraction of the people who are involved in the theatre industry, the mm. sound techs and the lighting and the carpenters and the stage managers and the box office. Thousands and thousands of, of people are involved with, uh, with the, the, the theatre and often, sadly, they've fallen a bit between the gaps of, of government funding. So it's... Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's really great that they can get back to work and even more great that audiences um, uh, mm. can experience theatre in, in a safe way. And, and how's lockdown been for you as somebody who's you know writing a lot? Has it meant that you've been able to get more done? Obviously, you've been extremely busy on publishing uh, the NHS book. But, you know, do you see that there are different um, ways that you've been able to get through uh, this period? And how, how do you have any advice for the rest of us on like how to cope with the uncertainty and the challenges of being under these different measures? It's I, I mean, I've been extremely lucky and I know that um, uh, I haven't um, lost anyone uh, who's who's close to me. The, the elderly and the vulnerable people um, in my life have thankfully been um, been safe. And that is obviously not the case for tens of thousands of families. Um, I'm also very privileged in that I have a garden, and I've, you know, I've, I've got friends who are, you know, live on the 14th floor of, you know, blocks of flats, with, you know, without a balcony, you know, yeah. and often with a one-year-old. And you know, I really feel for people whose lockdowns have have looked like that. And you know, and I work from home. Um, you know, as, as as a writer, so in a way, it hasn't been the it hasn't been the hugest change. But um, lockdown is tremendously difficult for lots of people, and that's why you know I'm very glad that I'm not one of the people making the decisions about you know what you do. It's sort of it isn't as simple as uh, you know lockdown equals equals good, um, and that will sort everything out. It has huge, huge, wide ranging implications um, for people and, you know, and their mental well-being is 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 one of them. Um, the answer isn't simple um, and it, there are obviously many aspects to it, um, but the big thing is making sure that you still have a support network and um, it's obviously much, much harder when you can't see people in person, but um, it is it is possible and um and i think we all have a responsibility not just to ourselves but to 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 think about the people in our lives who might be um struggling more than than we are and to and to look out for for them and um that's that you know that's something i've i've, I've tried to do a bit uh, and it's something i can definitely do um do a lot more mm. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, as you look forward, uh, and I know you're not an, an expert on the pandemic like any of us, but how do you see things unfolding in, in coming months? Do you see areas for hope? Do you uh, uh, hold out sort of, you know, vaccines as being the, the way that we're going to get out of this? Or do we have to expect to be in, in some kind of uh, regulations for a long period to come? I think I think it's probably a bit of both. I think ultimately, vaccines are the best chance of, of steering away through this but um, I think people would be wrong to think that a vaccine is going to appear and then a week later the virus is going to disappear. Um, I think there will be a, a prolonged period of learning to adapt and change the way we do things and coexist with this virus, I suspect it might exist in a way that, you know, is obviously a very different um, bug to influenza, but the way that, you know, we, we know that that's part of our lives and we know that there's vaccination uh, for vulnerable people. Um, I think that's that's more along the lines we should think about it. Quite how the rest of the year is going to play out, I don't really know. I would say though that this virus behaves, has behaved and will continue to behave predictably and there's nothing magic about England that doesn't apply to to France and Germany and you know Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland and you know there's there's no there's nothing that pluck and spirit will will will, will help the you know viruses behave predictably and, and 
I, I fear we're in the we're in the, the foothills of it of it all about to get worse. Yeah, it seems that despite the you know huge array of government responses in lots of different countries, that you know most similar European countries are moving in a very similar uh, direction at the moment. So I'm sure, sure you're right about uh, about that. One of the things you've obviously got an immense talent for, Adam, is is finding humanity and humour in even the most extreme uh, extreme situations. Are you finding humour still as you go through life? Uh, are you finding moments of uh, inspiration and humanity that touch you and, and kind of feed that creative side of your um, side of your personality? I, th I think it does. It still remains my my coping mechanism, and uh, I continue to keep a diary. And I I do find looking back through my diaries of you know when I look back through months and years, um, when life is easier. I write a lot less, and when life is difficult, I I write a lot. Um, I like to write a lot more, and we all need to think about how we how we cope. And I realise that uh, my advice isn't necessarily that everyone should go and write a diary, but everyone should everyone should have some kind of uh, some kind of crutch. Absolutely. Well, let me, let me turn now to Vicky. I think we've got uh, a couple of questions have flooded in from our from our audience, our live audience. Hi, Vicky. Hey there again. Um, we have indeed, actually. Um, can we bring up Lorraine Martin's question here? She's, um, as you, thank you for talking to today, Adam. Given that people are in hospital at the moment and are not allowed any visitors, what's the one thing you think their friends and family can do from afar to help the most? Oh, it's 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 so difficult, and I I I, I do feel really desperately for people who can't visit 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 their loved ones in in, in hospital. I, I don't know if there's an easy answer. It's, it's. I'm sure it's a case of letting them know that they're not alone. It's very isolating being in being in hospital, and um, as both a patient and as a relative, I know that you know the importance of checking in. And if it can't be in person, then if it can be digitally, or even a card, or a letter, or just just to just let, to, 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 to remind them that they're, they are loved even if they can't hug anyone. It's harrowing, isn't it? It really is difficult. And actually, we bring up Lottie's question because it's kind of following on the NHS theme as well. Um, do you have any advice for someone like yourself that's left the NHS and that they're at a crossroads whether to go back or not? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so, it's such a, it's such a personal, personal thing. And I hugely miss working in the NHS. Um, I know, obviously, the arts have huge value, immeasurable value, but there are obviously a number of degrees of separation from, you know, what I do and hopefully making the odd person laugh and the job I used to do, which is, you know, working on a labour ward, you know, you know, saving a, you know, a baby's life, saving a mum's life potentially. And, and I was. I would frequently drive home three hours late, splattered with blood, exhausted, dinner in the dog. But I still had a smile on my face because nothing, nothing beats that feeling of doing something sort of good, useful. And I dare say that I will end up um, back um, in the health service in some capacity when when I've reached the end of my shelf life. As, as an author, a performer, which, which you know, everyone obviously does. I, I think I've done my last cesarean section, but I'd love to be involved back with uh, educating medical students or, or doctors, or maybe on at the policy side of things, but there is an inexorable draw for people who used to work in the health service back to the health service. And it's a question of working out if you want to go back in what way and at what time. But I think anyone who's ever left that, it, ne it never leaves you that, 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 that you, you feel you should you should head back i mean quite clearly even from your books now you're still educating children you're educating my children at this moment in time you know so i think you've still got it you've still got it i yeah good on you and and thinking to your current career then in terms of being on stage um one of the questions here there's there's rob if you look at rob lee Wayne's question when you started doing stand-up did you find you learn new ways of connecting with people. Is it something you might recommend to doctors to do with to improve communication skills? Blending that's, two very, that's very, very interesting. I think that medicine is 
it's a communications job. And that's why I think we need to drop the A-level requirements. You know, you don't want your, your doctor to be, you know, an idiot, obviously. But I don't think it's a job where you need to have all of these grade A's. No one's ever going to expect you to uh, memorise and recite biochemical pathways. Um, it's about it's about a personal connection. And I think we need to be recruiting people who understand that and, and, and get that. Um, um, I was uh, I was the first year in my medical school to be taught communication skills as part of the syllabus. Um, and it feels very odd that it w there were you know, decades and decades and decades where where it wasn't it wasn't even touched upon. And in fact, I remember um, saying to a, a consultant when you're a medical student, you, you trail around behind all the, all the bosses. And I said, oh, sorry, I've got to, got to dash off. Now I've got my communication skills lecture. And, uh, and a, and a um, consultant said, communication skills you can't teach that what nonsense but that's honestly what the, the, some people some people thought and um uh i've you know i've i am now doing an awful lot more communication than than i than i was and i'm probably i'm, I'm doubtless a better uh communicator i'm lucky enough to get on stage i'm lucky enough to be to be interviewed and uh, and to you know to bang on about uh, about my uh, my my my, my various um, messages and, and bugbears, um, and um, yeah, it has helped me. And and I, and I think it is worth um, the medical profession thinking wider about how you can get how, how you can improve communication. I wholeheartedly agree. I think back to when we were told about George's cancer diagnosis. You can't. Del you need advice on that. You need to know how to do that in a you know, obviously it's compelling, compassionate way that will come naturally, but there's so much other stuff around it. You talked about mental health. There's so many, there's so many mm. layers to that role and that job. Um, there are, I absolutely agree. And, and I think even, even though doctors are now taught how to break bad news and there's a huge amount of evidence about how to do it in an effective, in a compassionate way and in a way that um, the people you're telling really understand it and remember it. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence about that. That needs to be taught alongside how you as the, the doctor cope with what you've just done because you learn in GCSE physics about every action having an equal and opposite reaction in medicine it's obviously never equal it can't be a fraction obviously of the pain and anguish it causes a patient and their family but there's always always something comes back and it's cumulative when you've done that 20 times you know um or you've had 20 you know bad experiences um you know, we, we, we've lost a patient or something like that. It does really take its toll. And doctors do need to be taught how they themselves can look after themselves. Because if they're not looking after themselves, there's no way they can look after their patients. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Just from our side of the fence and seeing how, and, and we get to know, you talked about people remembering your name and, and, and all the people that helped them through their, pro we, we're exactly the same. Um, on the oncology theme, there's a question from Claire Walsh that's just come up. Love your work, Adam. My sister is an oncology nurse and is stunning how poorly nurses are paid. What actions could the public take to help those that care for us that are sick is that are paid, make sure they're paid appropriately? Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And um, um, somehow nurses in particular always manage to avoid getting um, getting a pay increase or somehow they're always the one whose bursaries get, um, you know, get, get depleted. And I think it's, it's absolutely shameful. Um, ultimately, you can make a difference by making, by making a noise. These are, you know, these are decisions that are made by people right at the top, but they're answer, you know, the ministers are answerable to the MPs and the MPs are answerable to constituents. And um, you can you can vote them in and you can vote them out, but also you can you can write to them about anything. You know that's their job is to listen to you, and you know and one of the wonderful things about social media in particular is it's very easy to mobilise large numbers of people on the same topic. And like you see it often, like if if an A and E department's being shut down or something, you know an MP. You know, can quite easily ignore one or two people who say, what are you doing about this? They can't ignore 
300, 3,000, 10,000 people making some making some noise. And I think people forget quite how much power that they do have and and cumulatively what they can what they can achieve. Obviously, pay shouldn't be a matter of charity, but it just strikes me seeing you both on the screen here between you. You've raised over two million pounds in support of the NHS via sort of charity donations. And that's 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 long been, I guess, one of the ways in which we can support health. Uh, do you think there's a, a, a continued role for charity alongside um, state funding for, for these services? And how, how does charity fit in? Adam, you're a trustee of a charity and Vicky, obviously, you've set up a charity. Interested in your views. Um, in an ideal world, there would be adequate funding for everything that needed to needed to to, to happen. But we don't live in an ideal world, and until we do, there'll be a huge role for, mm. for charity. For example, like the air ambulance in in London is is a charity that is all funded by mm. by donations. You know, Macmillan nurses. Um, a huge amount of um, uh, of research happens through charities, and also a lot of the stuff that are just sort of lovely add-ons you know that aren't core that are, you know the, the 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 gardens you know for 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 patients and their families to enjoy in in hospital the the coffee machine that the the pediatric unit might otherwise not have a lot of that is funded by um by 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 charity and yeah i mean it, i'd love to live in a world where we didn't need any charities but mm -hmm. But we're not there, and and uh, and I think there's there are you know tens of thousands of people um, in the in the charitable sector doing absolutely extraordinary work, and particularly um, helping the health service. And Vicky, what about your experience? Well, I was going to say, so for us, we we never realised how underfunded childhood cancer was. We didn't realise that Cancer Research UK only give one percent to children and anyone under the age of twenty four. Actually, we had no idea. So when we found that out. As most Googlers would feel, we, we, we're fixers, we're problem solvers. So we went into problem solving mode when we were dealing with the most catastrophic thing in our lives. It probably wasn't mental health wise the best thing to do, but we, we still do it to this day. Um, and actually, as Adam, you were saying earlier about a let out and writing a diary that, that it's kind of and built using social media. We created an army around this problem to try and solve it. But in the meantime, exactly to your point, Adam, we're also coming at it top down and we're working with Cancer Research UK with politicians and we're lobbying and we're trying to do coming at it from both angles because you need to find somewhere in the middle ground because it's not there's not money to solve for absolutely everything there never can be you know this ideal world really is so idyllic and COVID has thrown so many more complications into things but actually if bottom up we can fundraise and we can fulfill you know I think about the fact we've we've funded two play therapists play therapists that told my son he would wake up from surgery and he wouldn't be able to walk you know he was four for him to comprehend that was unfair like I can't even get my how 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 would you write that in your book, Adam? Like I literally how how do you do this? So that's what our fundraising has done. Um, but we do need to come at it from both angles because fundamentally the only way you're going to get change is by doing something. We could have sat and done nothing, but we, it actually helped us as well as an outlet. Um, but it's it's hard work, and COVID makes it that much harder. Um, you know the lullaby trust nhs charities together the giant pledge there are so many there are so many charities out there all doing great things how do you then judge which one you give your money to um it's it's really difficult thank you vicky for sharing that as well look we, we're almost out of out of time and i think you know where we started was the stories that are in this book uh, that touch us all and our own personal experiences of the health service and you've, you've shared so much uh, and just shining the spotlight on how we can help and you know, there's a, a while still we've got to get through all of this. Uh, so, uh, Vicky, thank you for sharing your story. And, and Adam, just before you go, a final word. Is there some optimism you can leave us with? Something that we can um, turn to in the darker moments of, of what we're going through at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very difficult time at the moment, but we do just have to realize that we will look back on this we will look back on the worst days and it will just be a memory and it is just a case of you know getting through what are clearly tough times because you know it, you know they will be all of our diary entries at some point in the future well, adam thank you for spending time with us and thank you for all those works that have entertained us and, and opened our eyes to just the heroic work that's been been done in the health service we've got links to uh, all of the books and where to go adam also has a website you can find it using your favorite search engine, which uh, has links to all of this uh, stuff as well. I really would encourage 
uh, a, a read. And if you can get to the stage show, then uh, you know how to find that as well with the links below. But for now, uh, Vicky, thank you for setting this up. And, and Adam Kane, enormous thanks for joining us back at Talks at Google. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.